And my name is David Chard. I'm the Dean of uh, Boston University's Wheelock College of Education and Human Development. I want to welcome you to this conversation with the Dean, a webinar series. This is a third in a new set of events focused on discussing recent events and important topics with scholars and leaders here at BU and BU Wheelock. So far, this series has garnered great interest and we've had some great conversations and uh, you can find those conversations online in our YouTube channel if you wanna look back at uh, the first two. Um, and we expect our conversation today to be uh, just as interesting and provocative. Um, the, this series is deeply rooted in our, our ongoing efforts um, on our guide star here in BU Wheelock, each discussion will focus on the complexity of an issue and seeks to uncover the transformational opportunities that we have to see students and communities thrive, which is what guides the work that we do at Boston University and at Wheelock College in particular. Um, if you have questions during the presentation and the um, panel discussion, you can put them in the uh, Q&A and we will be monitoring that. We'll try to thread some of your questions into the, um, into the presentation, but also uh, make time toward the end of the um, webinar to include other questions that perhaps we didn't cover in the, in the discussion. So, um, our, our The webinar that we're talking about uh, focuses on that guide star that I mentioned, and it also is about improving outcomes for students and delivering the best and um, greatest impact that we can have in our community. And uh, nationally, there's been a deep and persistent effort to draw, to draw back support within higher education to name diversity and equity as commitments and the various um, actions campuses have taken to live out those values. This has meant everything from legislation that has been passed to explicitly prohibit uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion offices, roles and practices to explicit uh, targeting of leaders and scholars and pressures on academic freedom within the research community. Just this morning, we uh, read in the higher ed uh, media that the state of Florida is now focusing on defunding DEI efforts in its state colleges, which it already started to do in its university systems. Uh, states like Florida have gotten a lot of headlines about this, but the undercurrents of this movement exist close to home as well. Recently, there has been quite a bit of coverage in our local papers here in Boston, as well as nationally, about the resignation of Dr. Claudine Gay at Harvard University, and a few months before that, turmoil over the Center for Anti-Racist Research here at Boston University. So that's the framing of our conversation today. And I'm really pleased to be joined today by my two colleagues here at Boston University Wheelock College, who in their work seek to center equity um, with the goal of illuminating uh, the goals and values of their scholarship and the impact these broader uh, shifts in our social and political landscape have on their specific research and scholarship. So let me introduce the two of them and then we'll get into a discussion. Kayleen Stevens is a clinical assistant professor at Boston University and the program director for social studies education at BU Wheelock. She is a faculty affiliate with Boston University's Center for Anti-Racist Research and the faculty lead for designing anti-racist curriculum fellowship. Her research interests lie in how to best include historically marginalized groups in the social studies classroom. And prior to her work at BU, she was a public school teacher and department head where she co-ran the new teacher program and spearheaded several initiatives to decolonize their curriculum and create more representation in advanced placement classes. Kayleen, welcome. It's good to see you. Um, Jerry Whitmore is a uh, junior, is an assistant professor of higher. I have never called you Jerry Whitmore, Jr. I think that is the first time and, and maybe the only time I'll do that. No offense to your father, but... Um, uh, Jerry is an assistant professor of higher education at BU's Wheelock College of Education and Human Development. He leads a research group named Higher Education Leadership Access and Equity. Uh, that group um, collaborates with undergraduate, graduate, and postdoctoral research uh, folks here in uh, Wheelock. They use quantitative methodology to explore racial differences in teaching and learning at academic institutions. They also develop leadership knowledge grounded in history and community context. 
Apart from uh, his research, Dr. Whitmore is actively involved in various roles. He serves as a PI on a racial equity Lumina grant with the Center for Anti-Racist Research and participates in the Sankofa Scholars Advisory Board and contributes to the BU First Gen Forward team. So Dr. Uh, Stevens, Dr. Whitmore, um, thank you both for joining us and I look forward to our conversation. We're gonna jump right in into this discussion, but be sure, as I said, to reserve time for questions for the audience. And as appropriate, we'll try to thread your questions into our discussion as we go. So what brought both of you to these specific topics? And I'd like to ask you to think, uh, you know, kind of respond both personally and professionally. What is it that you hope to see as a result of your work? Kayleen, do you want to get us started? Sure. Thank you, David. And thank you, everyone, for having me today. And Excited to talk about this timely and important work. Um, personally, I grew up in a really homogeneous community um, and didn't think about issues of DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion often. And then I became a public school teacher in a very diverse community, socioeconomically, racially, um, and had to play catch up and did a lot of unlearning and spent a lot of time um, studying this work, which did a lot eventually lead me to, to get my doctorate. Um, and my dissertation was focused on gender equity in the social studies classroom and sort of the underrepresentation and misrepresentation of women. And as I studied that, I realized that there are a lot more layers here. And I started thinking about intersectionality as a lens for that. So it's not just white women that are left out of the curriculum, but women of color, non-able-bodied people, neurodivergent people, social class, it, it, it goes and goes and goes. So. Um, me and um, my dissertation advisor at the time, Chris Martell, we worked on studying teachers who were doing a really great job teaching history for justice. They were thinking about these issues, having gender equitable con classrooms, having race conscious classrooms. And for about 10 years, we studied this, what it looks like in schools to really have equity centered classrooms, which led us to write our book, uh, Teaching History for Justice. Um, and now I'm very lucky to be here at BU Wheelock and get to, to work with pre-service teachers um, and see them um, and, and do all this envision in action. Hmm. Great, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Jerry, what brought you to this work, both per personally and professionally? I mean, it's a very good question. I, I ask myself actually this all the time, like, why am I here? No, um, you know, for I grew up in, in the South, uh, part of rural America in the state of Tennessee. And uh, I think for the most part of my life, I did not think about these particular issues in the way that that my the elders in my community uh, had done. And so when I was getting ready to graduate college, I had a central question, which was, why was I graduating? And my friends were not graduating at the particular time. It was about eight to 10 of us that were in a group that started school together. And I was the only one that walked across the stage at that particular time. Uh, and so I wanted to know. And then I started investigating the uh, um, particular programs the institution had and under trying to figure out, like, what was going on with the DF rate for students of color, primarily Black students. Uh, and so that kind of started my trajectory. Uh, and then I would like to say I picked up another passion with that when I went home. People were like, oh, you were the good one. You made it out. So if anyone could do it, you could. Uh, that struck a chord with me um, to further my research interests to look at, like, I don't think that I was different. I understand that I was at the seat of the table that sometimes often others did not. And I was also shown opportunities that many individuals would, would never um, come across. And so that has led me to my kind of research thread and kind of my, the passion behind the work that I do. That's great. I want to remind audience members to put your questions in the Q&A. Um, we're also dropping links to references that people make in the, in the conversation so that in the, in the chat box, um, so that you can access uh, news articles that are of uh, topical relevance here. So thank you both for, so now our audience knows a little bit about you, what drove your interest, what got you to where you are today. I'm personally grateful that you're both here and um, love to work with you both. So let's though, talk a little bit beyond the rhetoric of the media that we've all read in the um, last, whether it's on social media or in more conventional media, but let's talk about 
the groundwork and the research that you've designed to improve outcomes for students, both in the K-12 sphere and in the higher ed sphere. And something I hope most of us can agree on, we want students to be successful. So I'd love it if each of you could describe one project that you're working on that you feel right now can actually connect with that goal of improving outcomes for, for students. Um, should we stay in order or does it matter? You, Kayleen, you go first, Jerry can go second, and then I'll mix it up after that. I know you said one, David, but I have three projects that, um, <laughs> research, research projects that I'm working on that I'm pretty passionate about that I do think are going to result in, in better outcomes for students. So my work, I identify as a public school teacher, and I really want to think about how we can bring equity work to classrooms. And one avenue to do that is civics but teaching civics differently, not through just the memorizing the branches of government, but actually empowering students to use the levers of democracy to make changes that they care about. So I have, I'm working on two grants right now. Um, one is through PBS um, called Youth Stand Up. Public, and, public broadcasting, is that the yeah, PBS? Yes, okay. yeah, yep. It's funded through the Institute of Educational um, Sciences. And they have created a beautiful civics curriculum that they've won Emmys, and it's amazing. Um, and the, it really, the goal of it is to empower students to have um, a real deep civic identity and think about the changes they can make in their community. And it's not necessarily partisan, but it is political. It's getting students to be involved. So I get to go into classrooms, see that curriculum in action, and provide feedback on that pilot. Another grant that we are working on currently is called Exploring Data Science Through the Lens of Civic Education, and that is funded through the National Science Foundation. And what we're doing is we're pairing a math teacher and a social studies teacher, and we're looking at big, big data sets and how you can use those big data sets to have students create civic action plans or social justice plans, right? So they're looking at school inequities or they're looking at um, the rates of homelessness in their community, then what can they in the social studies piece do next? And then the third project is unfunded. It's a passion project. Um, we're looking at divisive concept laws um, and their impact on teachers. We're looking at five different states, some liberal states, some more conservative states. So this summer we sent a survey out to every public school teacher in California, Massachusetts, some more liberal states, and then Tennessee, South Carolina, and Florida. And um, right now we're in the process of interviewing teachers from those different states to see what the landscape is. Because as you spoke about earlier, there's a lot of news, there's a lot of headlines, but we really wanted to get a feel for what's it like to be a teacher who's committed to teaching for justice in these states? How are you navigating these laws? Or if you don't have laws in these states, how are you navigating the fear around these laws? So those are my sort of three research projects I'm working on currently. So to circle back to what that means for outcomes, Kayleen, your in effort is related to helping students be better citizens, um, learn how to engage with our political system such that it is, and and um, be a part of decision making rather than having decisions made for them. Is that exactly. fair? Yeah, that's exactly right. If you look at the data on, on civic education, students are very apathetic, voter turnout rates for, for youth are low. And so we want to make those changes. We want students to feel like they can be part of this democracy, that they have a voice. Um, and I think that can start in school. And then the last one is a relation. The one Wait, there's another one? <laughs> no, no, the third one. I, mean, <laughs> I think that is outcomes for students too, because I think the best thing we can do to support students is to support teachers. So teachers who are doing this equity work who might be facing fear of being arrested or, or being made an example out of, if we support those teachers, then they can better support their students. Got it. Got it. Terrific. Uh, I just want the um, audience to know there's some great questions in the Q&A. I will get to them because they're really good, but I want to make sure we kind of um, set the stage for those. So, Jerry, what about you? Like, how, how do you think about the work you're doing impacting student outcomes and success, student success? Absolutely. So there's kind of like two basic threads. Um, one you kind of mentioned throughout um, when you were doing the introduction for me and 
that is STEM higher education success. And I look through that from an equity lens. We all we always hear about the um, the attainment gap of Black and Brown students when it comes to STEM degree success. Uh, and so one of my primary uh, primary work that I had done previously working with the University of Wisconsin was to create this kind of summer bridge program. And so the research kind of backed and you know became the underpinnings of that particular um, project as we saw, uh, as we look at that particular gap. And we're actually, my research lab is continuing to look at a longitudinal study as to what are those impacts beyond um, doctoral degrees for particular bioscience um, students. Uh, and then I would like to like quickly mention that I'm looking at another particular project, which is my large grant with the Lumina Foundation that actually looks at the impacts of student loan debt relief. Now, most people think about that as impacting students after they graduate, but we actually think about that prior to enrolling in schools. And so that is another way in which we look at how students actually approach higher education, what degrees they actually um, um, choose which can actually have an impact on how successful they are in said discipline, i.e. a student is choosing a lucrative degree, come to find out that's not their passion. So mm -hmm. are they gonna stay in that particular degree? So those are just kind of two different, you know, two ways that how I have been approaching that in all of the higher education um, context. That's great. So, so I wanna, um jump to a question about hurdles and challenges you see in the work that you do or that you've experienced in conducting this kind of research um, that exists because of the focus of the scholarship you are doing potentially, or where have you found support and avenues of support around those obstacles? And as you think about how you want to respond to that question, you know, the obstacles and areas of support, one of our guests has asked the question about your knowledge of specific policies that have promoted anti-racist practices in public education, if any, or in higher education, in your case, Jerry. So obstacles, hurdles, what kinds of supports you've received to overcome those, and then um, whether you're aware of any policies that are specifically um, designed to try to promote anti-racist practices. Jerry, you want to jump in first? <laughs> sure. Ooh, that's a lot. So I think for for the most part, I think for, for my particular work, there is one particular hurdle that I am actually experiencing right now. And um, as a state of working with research students to kind of look at comb through this mountain of data, students are actually approaching it kind of with a sense of, um, of they may be afraid to do this type of work because of the rhetoric that is actually out there, which is also disappointing. Uh, and so then, you know, the work that we're doing, they're kind of confused, like, should we actually say that this policy is hurting um, hurting Black students in particular? You know, how, how are we going to, you know, overcome that? And I think for the particular work that I do within higher education, it's actually investigating our own institutions. So that's almost like we're investigating my peers. So if we're looking at a particular class, like investigating our one of our intro biology sequence here, looking at that, it could either mean that we're not doing things right or we could be doing them very well. And so there is an obstacle about like, how will the institution perceive that, um, that particular work? As it pertains to particular policies um, that are out there for my student loan debt relief, uh, work. It's, we're in a challenging part right there where the federal government can't get its act together as to what <laughs> what does relief look like? And individual states and colleges as well, you know, dollars, amounts, tuitions are also fluctuating. So like we had a lab meeting this morning and we were finding out policies that we started to do research on, they're now defunct. And so the ever-changing environment that we're actually dealing with is actually impacting the work that me and my um, students are doing, which means that we also always have to stay current. Um, so I'll, I'll stop right there. Yeah, so so you you're saying that sometimes the policies are the hurdles. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I think that's what you know. For those of us who are on our journey about these topics, understand that as structural uh, uh, racism or structural whatever it is that does not support um, anti-racist practices that actually hinder us in in order to creating equity. Is that fair? Absolutely. Okay. 
Kayleen, how about at the K-12 level? I mean, I have to sort of agree with what Jerry said a lot. I think there's a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of fear. Um, and I think that fear can, um, in some cases, teachers will stop. Um, teachers will be uh, nervous to teach for justice. Even, even words have become um, fearful. Like even the word justice, I you know I've had to rewrite grants without the word social justice in them or the word equity. Um, I think this idea of a cancel culture is actually hurtful to doing this work because I think we need to have space and grace for people to grow, unlearn things and change. And I think teachers are, it, are sometimes afraid to even talk about race or gender or social class or sexual orientation or, or neurodivergence, any of the isms right in their classroom because they're like, oh no, like, am I gonna end up on the news or what if I say the wrong thing? And then of course, in some states, there's now laws against this work. You know, I've been speaking with Florida educators this week, and they all, they had their AP curriculum pulled a week before school starts because they couldn't talk about sexual orientation that was mentioned in the curriculum. So they threw out the curriculum, right? This, I mean, this is a real problem for teachers because they, every teacher I talk to, the same narrative, I want to do what's best for kids. I want to do what's best for kids. But it becomes harder and harder to do what's best for kids if I feel like, I'm under a microscope with either a law or um, someone thinking that I am trying to indoctrinate or hurt their kid. Um, teachers really, I mean, obviously, like everything, there's exceptions, but the teachers that I've met and I've researched and I've worked with, they really want to do what's best for kids. And I think not giving them the space to do that um, is, is a hurdle and a struggle. The question about policy is a good one. I'm seeing the opposite policies. I wish there were policies. Um, and if anyone knows about them, please. I will say, I think there are a lot of great initiatives. I, the Center for Anti-Racist Research here has been super, here at BU Wheelock has been super supportive of that. We, um, which you mentioned in the intro, David, like I'm part of a faculty group it's designing anti-racist curriculum. I'm the faculty lead there. We get together once a month, we create syllabi curriculum, we talk, we generate ideas. How do we have anti-racist courses, anti-racist syllabi? So I see a lot of initiatives. I don't know about structural changes, but um, that's a hope for sure. Yeah, I, you both have given us examples of policies that have actually hindered the work, right? Which I think may be, um, a point at, we are in a point in time where that is um uh we're seeing these either policies or uh dictates in particular states pushing back against the equity and inclusion work that we are trying to center at the college so i appreciate you're both mentioning that i think it's important kayleen you broached the topic of the center for anti-racist research and um I'd be curious for you both to talk a little bit more about what your experience has been like with CAR, as we call it here at BU, and um, maybe talk a little bit more about that community and how it has supported the work you're doing. And there's a question in the in the Q&A about um, how it informs BU's strategic plan, which we could probably all say something about. But yeah, I think um, maybe talk about your own work and its relationship to CAR. Um, and how how you've, you, as you've already stated, Kayleen, you're seeing some help for generating ideas, et cetera. So whoever wants to begin, that'd be great. Jerry, you want to start? With... Car. I was so excited. Oh, I think so many of us read Dr. Tendy's book and I have been doing equity work since the early 2000s when it was taboo to say the word white privilege to a classroom mm -hmm. of students. So then to have a center that's going to pay you and then <laughs> help you and, and support you to do equity work. So um, the Center for Anti-Racist Research CAR has, has been really great. And um, I was like probably one of the first applicants to be a faculty affiliate there. And then um, they asked me to be to uh, run the Designing Anti-Racist Curriculum um, Fellowship. And that's great because it's a collaboration between the whole university. So we have French professors and in med school, the people from the med school and math professors all working together on, on places that, right, my background is social studies, so it's kind of easy to think about anti-racism racism in the social classroom, but these are other spaces that we're talking about 
And we're talking about everything from uh, how are our assessment, how do we make anti-racist assessments? How do we make anti-racist classroom environments, right? What does it mean to have your students, if you are fully thinking about a, a classroom that challenges white supremacy, then are you the authority? Or are you co-collaborating your, your curriculum? So there's, there's all these wonderful conversations going on. And they're not just conversations because at the end of the fellowship, we produce our syllabi and our courses and, and, and share them with the community, which is great. So yeah, I think CAR has been incredibly supportive of the work we do. That's great. Jerry? Yeah, yeah I would like to say, uh, unlike Kaylin, I was not one of the first people to sign up for it. <laughs> um, I had to like kind of vet it out. I think as Kaylin kind of mentioned, all of our institutions, we put out these policies and I think I'm very intentional as being a black a faculty member, professor, researcher, scholar, um, in this higher education space, you know, just wanted to really see kind of the work behind it. Um, and my time there has has definitely been great. It's definitely helped in to grow my research portfolio and actually kind of have that synergy between the, the work that I'm doing and have the institutional support um, behind it. And that support at times come from personnel, dollars, research, um, research opportunities. And so um, the, the grant that I have with the Lumina Foundation is through CAR. And so we've been able to utilize research uh, individual support there to actually combine our work with a research uh, racial equity policy tracker. And so I don't have a link for that because we're actually building out that website right now. Um, so you all can look out, you know, in the future, next couple of months for us to launch a um, national map of actually diving into the potential policies around student loan forgiveness and how that is even helping or exacerbating the racial wealth gap among students, particularly um, of our students of color. Do you think that will ultimately go beyond um, the financial work policies, to other kinds of policies, Jerry? Absolutely. So one of the that we're really looking into is housing and degree attainment. Um, as well. So again, it's going to be something public facing and we want you, we want the consumer to understand that this isn't just something that is isolated into higher education or specifically on our campuses, but it goes into a part of quality of life. Yeah, interesting. So um, one of the roles that you both play, in addition to the work you do in your research and scholarship, is that you teach here. Um, you're impacting, shocking, right? We're in higher ed, you teach. Um, uh, you both are in the classroom, you're working with young professionals who are either preparing to be teachers or preparing to be higher ed. Many of them are actually in higher ed, right, Jerry? Some of your students are already professionals in higher ed seeking higher degrees. So um, what does it sound like to talk with those young professionals as they look out and think about navigating kind of this landscape of um, their preparation programs or their higher ed institutions, you know, what is it, what are those conversations like? Are they hopeful? Are they fearful as you described with other teachers, Kayleen? How, how are you, how does this land for our students? I, and this is my favorite part of the job is teaching and advising um, pre-service teachers and people who are starting their careers and, and DEI work. Um, we just created a master's in equity and social justice, Felicity Crawford. I was grateful just to help her on that. And um, so I'm teaching actually tonight is our first RS630 class. So we took our intro to research class and we decided to center equity around it. So we're still teaching all the basic research methods, but instead we're thinking about how to best help historically marginalized communities. Additionally, we're highlighting all the work at Wheelock that people are doing, whether that's disability rights or socioeconomic class, and to see how, oh, how can I do research for equity? Well, I have had the pleasure of talking to some people who, who I haven't even yet met, because I meet them tonight, and they are so dedicated to this work. We have someone who is designing curriculum for the preschool, for anti-racist work in the preschool. We have someone else who um, is creating support for how to talk to uh, as a parent of color, how to talk to your students of color about um, being an anti-racist and what that means. We have, um, they're just so excited and really, really want to do this work. And um, they really invigorate me. Additionally, my main gig is to work 
with teachers and pre-service teachers. So mostly teachers just really, really want to do this work. They want to see the social studies classroom in particular as a space to reduce racism, sexism, classism, homophobia, right? They want to use the classroom to create students, to empower them for change. And some of them have amazing ideas that I can learn from and others, it's about how do you do this work? How do you get support from administration? What does a curriculum that is decolonized look like? What is a, what is a classroom where you are an advocate for your historically marginalized students? What does that mean? I mean, having those kind of conversations. So <laughs> advising and teaching is, is such a big part of my job. And I'm, I'm so grateful for this next generation of educators because they, from what I see, they really want to do this work and we want to provide a roadmap for how to do it. Jerry? Yeah, and I think for mine, uh, the students that I work with, they're actually a few years beyond this, uh, the years of, uh, that Kayleen is working with. So I have those graduate students. So um, I would like to say they're hopeful because they come back to class and they, <laughs> they want to be part of these research endeavors. And I think since they're all coming to this space, this could be teachers who want to be principals and or principals who are actually looking to advance and then we have those higher education professionals. Those individuals have work experience in the particular areas that, that we're speaking about today. So many of them are very, I mean, they're looking at this is from a critical lens. And so they're asking, you know, more robust questions. Uh, they are, you know, really having those uncomfortable conversations. Uh, I think the, the biggest challenge for me at times is that these group of you know, scholar, young scholars and professionals, they're oftentimes looking at me to give them answers to the problems that we're dealing with in the world. And I would like to say a biggest, you know, one of the biggest roles that I occupy is to give them information um, for them to make informed decisions um, of their own. And um, of course, it's exciting, but at the same time for, you know, these professionals with years of experience that I typically work with being in the classroom, I think it's one of those uh, moments is kind of like a struggle. It's happiness, but it's also from an equity lens. Oftentimes, it's we have some some tough classes and in unpacking the structural uh, inequities that we have across um, our country as it pertains to education. Because we're also trying to be forward thinking in our current students as to like how are you going to impact the future? You're going to be our next generation of of the hope um, that we do have. Yeah, I'm wondering, I realize that's a lot to ask of you, right, to answer all of their world kind of groundbreaking questions. But I also think I can say for myself as a white middle-aged guy, some of this is is um, mind, like it really, um, you realize you've been brainwashed, right? Like you realize there were structures that prevented people from owning homes, for example, that just seem um, inconsistent with what you believed the values of your country were. And then you realize that that's not the case. There's legal documentation to show over and over and over again across the country, we prevented people from home ownership. So I think some of it, Jerry, is they're looking for faculty to be um, kind of docents, right, through the world that they're trying to unpack and help them process it. And if um, I could jump in there on that, I would yeah. like to say things highlights that I, I did not mention is that in my classroom, we make sure that you are going to get a diverse a diverse set of readings from individuals, different parts of the country. You are not going to come here, you know, and get the typical whitewash text of any subject. I don't, I, you know, I don't care if we're talking about paradigms of research. We're going to talk about specifically why specific research was utilized and what voices were missing from from that particular context. Um, and in those moments, it's it becomes a it's it's challenging, but it's exciting. Yeah, well, and many of us have heard that for faculty of color, this is a lot of pressure. And that's one of the questions in the uh, Q&A, Jerry, I want you to address directly. The, the question is really about how you navigate the pressures of representing people of color and what's expected of you in that kind of, for some people in that framework, when you really want to do, uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, the per th this person has said they have felt tokenized in some instances. And, um, and yet, here you are, right, in front of a group of students trying to help them unpack uh, 
centuries of racism and uh, classism, et cetera. How do you how do you balance that? Well, one is having a great dean <laughs> like you. <laughs> I had this I had a conversation about a classroom experience within my first year here, and that kind of really unlocked uh, the relationship that I had with the institution, you in particular, uh, where I could actually speak up in these these particular moments. I think being a faculty member and a professor here at Boston University, in order for me to get here, which we don't have time to unpack, I've been in many spaces where I have been the only, not only the only person of color, but the only, always typically the only Black person, even if it is a group uh, of people of color. And being able to find my voice and being comfortable um, there and finding my way through uh, uh, different different modes of, you know, how I've kind of thought about things and to be able to be comfortable has definitely helped me. And then calling out those moments when I feel like I've been tokenized. You know, don't reach out to me to come speak at your class because you are in the part of the semester where you're you're talking about uh, equity or issues that have impacted Black students. Don't call me for that, you know? Um, and then, you know, when we have, you know, uh, visit days with students, don't send the Black and Brown students to come talk to me about, you know, being, being their advisor. Um, so being able to find my voice, and I would like to say early on, I wasn't as comfortable because I think many people that occupy the position I do think about the backlash that could happen um, and or thinking about those gatekeepers that definitely could keep us out. Um, so I, I think that's important to think about it like that. But it is one that I've thought about. And I think it's just pressures and things that I've, I've dealt with and I'm still dealing with. Um, but you got to find your community. And sometimes your community may not be on your campus um, to kind of think through those particular moments. Yeah. I, I appreciate that. And I'm I hope the guest who filed that question appreciates it as well. There's a quick question, Jared, maybe a quick question about um, iPads, assuming you use iPads data for some of your work. Um, are there variables or data that you think could be added to that data set that would be helpful? I, this is from someone named Veronica. Yes. Veronica, are you managing yes. iPads? Because we <laughs> we could use <laughs> we could use an insider to help us with that. So a few years ago, probably about like almost two or three years ago, I was part of a data institute with uh, the government. We were working with IPAS data along with the other. It was the NCES uh, Data Institute. And so one of the things that we talked about was the changing uh, the changing qualifications or classifications for demographics for our students and how we needed more of that information to accurately be accurately reflected in our particular research as it pertains to like gender um, identity. Uh, we wanted to have better um, items to uh, be able to track students um, as well. Um, so those were like the, the kind of biggest hurdles that we were seeing um, in IPAS data. And I think it's not only asking me about this particular question, but like, the individuals that are like in our registrar's office, the ones that collect this data by what the 14th or 15th day of classroom. And we wanted to make sure that matched because one of the things that we do know as uh, researchers, like we will utilize iPads data, but we will supplement that from campus level data that for us completes the, completes the data set for us. Um, and so I guess that's kind of a, a simple answer. I, I can't point to more more specific items um, on there, but we want, again, we understand that it hasn't changed and we want it to kind of grow and change to the particular research questions uh, that that we're asking. Yeah, uh, Veronica, I hope that's helpful. Uh, there's a question that is a little bit tricky I wanna raise for both of you before we wrap up at 345 and it's about um, academic freedom and freedom of expression on campuses. Um, uh, and what what BU's policies are on this? BU has an explicit policy on uh, freedom of expression, and and we have a definition of academic freedom and what that means. But any general thoughts either of you want to share about that? Your your perceptions on this campus of how that's managed? Um, I think it's important for you to be able to speak speak freely about that. Um, I, I think that's why this webinar is so important. I think 
places of higher ed have an obligation to do this work, to do the more radical work, because not that even DEI work should be considered radical, it really should, but because we do have academic freedom and we do have protections in place that public school teachers don't always have, right? So I think we need to be leaders in this field and we need to be able to say the thing when you, you see structural racism at play, call that out, right? And, and I think that because we have so many advantages here, being, uh, being a, our one institution and being able to have academic freedom to say what we want to say, we need to, to use it, for lack of a better word, for good. I don't know, Jerry, if you want to add to that. I'm just, I think you kind of summed it up. I think outside of us having, you know, the, you, the expressed um, policy, I think most of us as faculty members, we kind of go through school understanding that we have free speech rights. Particular moments that we're in right now will make us actually go back and look at that policy. <laughs> um, but we kind of operate under um, under this assumption. And, um, and so I think that, yes, we do have this, but let me be clear and say, I'm not afraid of my free speech rights from BU point standpoint. It's outside voices who are going to potentially misinterpret what I'm doing inside and outside the classroom to make, uh, to kind of chill the environment. Good. So we have a few minutes left. I'm just checking for any other, there's a great question for you, Jerry, that I um, want to point out. Um, and I want to read it to you because I love the way it's stated. Dr. Whitmore, as an esteemed scholar, how would you direct, <laughs> don't we love that? How would you direct a student of color to find their community while attending a predominantly white institution? I think it's a really important question. I think I know this individual. I just looked at it, Dr. <laughs> um, I think, you know what, I, to be honest, I think this answer actually changes today because of the particular policies that we see across the country. So one, I would have given a blanket um, answer to this today. I would tell you that we have to, as far as institutions, create uh, more spaces for students, um, students of color to find their community in um, several ways, in classroom spaces, um, creating more events for faculty to engage with, with students, to help them find, uh, find their communities. I think that's kind of the most important thing. Again, part of the research that I'm doing is that saying that institutional commitment impacts degree attainment. So a student with a high GPA coming out of college, same GPA as a white student, may not matriculate towards graduation. The biggest hurdle is institutional commitment and being able to find their community. And so we have to understand that it needs to be in the forefront. And I think for all of us that work in higher ed and work on these college and university campuses, we need to really understand our student population and our students. And we have to know which resources to put in front of students. So, you know, this light bulb would turn on and be like, all right, this is my space. Yeah. This is this is where I belong. And that's multidimensional, right? It's, it's also making sure people have resources to uh, feed themselves. And I mean, it's, it's not simply uh, an academic question, I think, nor is it simply a relational question. There are some really important uh, other elements that go along with helping all of our students be successful. Um, uh, wow, we've run out of time. Um, and I didn't even get to ask you the last question was what it, what what are you excited about in your work? Clearly, you're excited about the work you're doing and the ongoing work you're doing. I want to thank you both for taking the time from your schedules to be part of this conversation. I'm proud to be your colleague and um, excited about the work you're doing. Uh, I also want to let the audience know that these recordings sit on the B Wheelock YouTube channel. So you can recommend p other people watch them if, if you think it's worth their um, getting to know Kayleen and Jerry a little bit. Um, you can also get involved at BU Wheelock, certainly um, help us in our uh, uh, various work that we do. You can um, reach out to Mary Churchill, our program director for higher ed administration, where um, Jerry is part of that faculty. Kayleen is our program director in social studies. If you have further questions, they would both welcome follow up. And you see a link there to the Center for Anti-Racist Research. We have uh, 
webinars coming up in February, one on um, uh, the science of reading, big announcement um, last yesterday from the governor about supporting the funding of transformational um, programs in Massachusetts schools related to the science of reading. And then uh, February 15th, um, Dr. Edson, oh, that's with uh, Drs. Kate Frankel and Nancy Nelson. And then um, February 15th, we'll focus on the psychology of excellence with our uh, the, the head of our sports psychology program. And I think you'll find that the work that um, Dr. Filio does, Edson, is really um, uh, transcends boundaries. It's not just about sport. It's about excellence in any kind of setting. So um, please join us for these webinars. I'm hoping that uh, you're all seeing the value of uh, hearing some of the wonderful work that's being done here at BU Wheelock. And again, Kayleen and Jerry, thank you both so much for your input and for the work that you're doing, what you're committed to. We're, we're fortunate that you're here, part of our team. Everyone have a great afternoon, and uh, we look forward to seeing you on February 1st, if not sooner. All right, bye now. Thank you. Thanks, Kayleen. Thank you all. Thank you, Jerry. Good to have you here.